Good morning. Welcome to worship at First United Presbyterian Church of Turlock. We welcome those who are with us in person, those who are joining us through broadcast at Covenant Living, and those who are with us from other parts of our nation. If you are new to our church or would like more information, please fill out the welcome card in your pew and place it in the offering box in the back of the sanctuary. We do hope that you leave this worship service feeling the peace of God within you. We do have a few announcements this morning. This week, our sixth through eighth graders are going to Calvin Crest Camp with Stephanie for a whole week um, filled with adventures and lessons about God. Um, please keep them in their prayers just for, for safe travel, um, God's provision, and that they may learn um, to lean on God more and gain a more intimate relationship with Christ. Um, we will continue our Wednesday night fellowship from 5 to 6.30 p.m. this Wednesday. Um, to, this week we're having lasagna, both vegetarian as well as meat options. Um, they only ask for a $5 donation per plate to help with the cost of food, so please come, bring a friend if you'd like. In a, in a couple of weeks, the tutoring reading program is gonna be starting for the summer session. Uh, it will be July 19th to August 9th, and it's available for any children um, through, through, from first grade through sixth grade on Wednesdays from 3.30 to 5 p.m. But we are looking for more tutors. So if you are interested um, or would like more information, please contact Stephanie for more. Finally, if we could please keep our elders in our prayers um, during this difficult time of transition, trying to figure out what's gonna be best for our church family, it would be great if we could um, always pray for our elders and keep them in mind. All right, our call to worship. When we consider your heavens, the work of your fingers, the moon and the stars, which have you set in place, which you have set in place? What is man that you are mindful of him? Why do you bother with us? Why take a second look our way? You have been our dwelling place throughout all generations, before the mountains were born, or you brought forth the earth and the world, from everlasting to everlasting, you are God. Please join us for our opening hymn, All Hail the Power of Jesus' Name, number 142 are in your hymnals or as displayed on the monitors.
please join me in our prayer of confession as it is in your bulletins or displayed on the monitors. Most holy and merciful Father, I acknowledge and confess before you my sinful nature. I have fallen short of your desire for my life. I have dishonored you through neglect, disdain, and have often loved other things or people more than you. Instead of glorifying you by trusting you, I have found security and trust in other things. Instead of glorifying you by being thankful to you for life, I have dishonored you by ignoring your generosity and by treating life as a right and happiness as something I deserve, not as a free gift of your grace. Instead of glorifying you by obedience, I disregard your wisdom. In Jesus' most precious name, please forgive me and cleanse me. Amen. Therefore, there is now no condemnation. Underline no. No condemnation. Because through Christ Jesus, the law of the spirit of life set me free from the law of sin and death. Is this not great news? For each one of us, we are forgiven. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. Amen. Amen. All right. If you would turn and, and greet one another in whatever manner you can. And uh, the cameras as well. Good morning. I'm once again blessed and honored to be able to share the Word of God with you. I would like to invite you to take out the Nicene Creed uh, insert. It will not stand alone after the sermon. It's going to be part of my conclusion in which we uh, lift up who Jesus is and what God has done through him. Uh, and then I will complete the conclusion and then we're done with the sermon. The scripture today is from John chapter 2, and I'm going to go over a little bit in the beginning of the sermon, the significance, but in my humble opinion, this is the greatest of all of these miracles outside of his own resurrection. Because in every other miracle that is recorded for us, he took existing material and just did something with it. In this miracle, it's the only one I know of, he took something that was totally inorganic, water, and turned it into organic, wine. He changed the entire nature. He transformed everything about water to make it into wine. And everything else he did was doing something with nature, but he didn't change the nature of it. Uh, even in the resurrection, he came back to life. He didn't change. So I think this is one of the most significant miracles that sets us up for how John especially records everything that Jesus did to complete his mission in his time. On the third day, a wedding took place in Cana in Galilee. Jesus' mother was there, 
And Jesus and his disciples had also been invited to the wedding. When the wine was gone, Jesus' mother said to him, They have no more wine. Dear woman, why do you involve me? Jesus replied, My time has not yet come. His mother said to the servants, Do whatever he tells you. Nearby stood six stone water jars, the kind used by the Jews for ceremonial washing, each holding from 20 to 30 gallons. Jesus said to the servants, fill the jars with water. So they filled them to the brim. And then he told them, now draw some out and take it to the master of the banquet. They did so. He did not, uh, and the, they did so, and the master of the banquet tasted the water that had been turned to wine. He did not realize where it had come from, though the servants who had drawn the water knew. And then he called the bridegroom aside, and he said, everyone brings out the choice wine first, and then the cheaper wine after the guests have had too much to drink. But you have saved the best until now. This the first of his miraculous signs Jesus performed at Cana in Galilee. He thus revealed his glory, and his disciples put their faith in him. Grace to you and peace from God the Father of our Lord Jesus Christ. Let us pray. And now, Heavenly Father, may the words of my mouth and may the meditations of each of our hearts be acceptable in thy sight, O Lord our rock and our Redeemer. Amen. Wow, 45 minutes. <laughs> I'm just kidding. On July 2nd, 1932, Franklin Delano Roosevelt made a nomination acceptance speech that stirred the American people. He summed it up in these most famous line, I pledge to you, I pledge myself, to a new deal for the American people. Now, whatever you think about the New Deal and the politics, etc., you have to admit it happened. When Roosevelt took the White House, things changed. A New Deal at that point was a dream, a dream that something could happen to bring the end to a depression that was choking the life out of America. Martin Luther King Jr gave a famous I Have a Dream speech in 1963. He said, I still have a dream. It's a dream deeply rooted in the American dream. I have a dream that one day this nation will rise up and live out the true meaning of the creed. We hold these truths to be self-evident that all men are created equal. I have a dream that my four little children will one day live in, in a nation where they will not be judged by the color of their skin but by the content of their character. I have a dream today when we allow freedom ring, when we let it ring from every village and every hamlet, from every state and every city, we will be able to speed up that day when all of God's children, black men and white men, Jews and Gentiles, Protestants and Catholics, will be able to join hands and sing in the words of the old Negro spiritual, free at last, free at last, Thank God Almighty, we are free at last. Dreams leave us striving for it to be completed. And when it happens, we're free at last. Cana, the city in which Jesus was now heading toward, was the first place that Jesus performed a sign or a miracle that that dream was coming true. In Jesus, we have a new deal. God was transforming and changing how he had worked. He was bringing it to completion. They were a people who lived with dreams shattered. Under Roman rule, ruthlessly having to work hard and have their being taxed by their own kind. Dreams have a way of dying. We need new dreams or new deals. I love Les Miserables, the, both the book as well as the stage play. And there's a song that Fontaine sings, Fontaine sings, I've dreamed a dream. She sings, I dreamed a dream in time gone by, when hope was high and life worth living. We all start off that way. 
And dreams were, I love this line because it's so true, were made and used and wasted. If I only could go back in time, you know. But the tigers came at night with their voices soft as thunder. As they tear your hope apart, as they turn your dream to shame, I had a dream my life would be so different from this hell I'm living, so different now from what it seemed. Now life has killed the dream I dreamed. And that's pretty much what was happening in Cana in terms of its place in Israel, but especially to a young couple getting married. Shame was soon to be upon them. But Jesus brings a new deal, a new dream, a whole new order of existence that will heal dreams and reinstitute the process of how to accomplish them. He says in John, I have come that you might have life and have life abundantly. Oh, really, God? Look around at where we are now. Is this abundant? Well, it is when Jesus can transform it. The ordinary life and ordinary things that happen in life and transform it. Now, John likes to use different witnesses pointing to who Jesus was. In chapter 1, he sets the whole stage up with signs, John the Baptist in particular, and, and the first disciples being called, and then in chapter 2, two miracles, the one we're going to cover today and one where he cleanses the temple. The first miracle he does in Cana was to help encourage the new faith of his new disciples. They were going to face a lot in three years, and at the end of three years, they were going to face a whole lot more. The end of their dream, that life seemed to have killed the dream they were dreaming. In a classic st story, A Tale of Two Cities, Charles Dickens uh, summarizes his whole book in an opening line. He says, it's the best of times and it was the worst of times. It was the age of wisdom and it was the age of foolishness. It was the uh, epoch of belief and it was the epoch of incred incredulity. It was a season of light, it was a season of darkness. It was the spring of hope and it was the winter of despair. We had everything before us, we had nothing before us. We were all going direct to heaven we were all going direct to the other way. And that's kind of like Cana and Judah, and in fact, all of humanity. John begins his work with a prelude, kind of like that. He wants to tell his people what's happening. He wants to show a glimmer of the major themes of his book, the deity of Jesus, Jesus is light and life, the world is in darkness, the witness of John the Baptist, and the examples of glory, grace, and truth that are in Jesus. Everything in the rest of the book of John develops around those, th those things. Now, there are times when you get a crossword, and you work really hard on it, or, or a puzzle, and you can exclaim at the end, I got it. There's other times that I've experienced watching a movie or like watching Les Mis or reading the book that it gets me. Something happens that just grabs my heart and my soul and I have to share it. This event at Cana grabbed the disciples. It encouraged them for what they were to face in the future. And my prayer is that you also would be grabbed by the reality of what happened at this wedding. John introduces his gospel by saying the word was life. The word created. The word was with God. The word spoken and symbolized. In medieval Italy, Christian merchants in Rome were losing business because of Jewish merchants. So they decided to go right to the head. They went to the Pope to do something to make the Jews leave town. The Pope contemplated the situation for a bit and then decided he would do it through a debate. He would debate with a Jew for uh, three rounds. If the Pope won the debate, the Jews had three days to get out of town. If the Jews won, they could stay. Of course, the Christian merchants were delighted 
They saw little hope of anybody standing up and out talking or out dialoguing or out debating the Pope. And then they learned the uniqueness of this debate. It was to be no speeches, no spoken words, only gestures. The Jewish merchants were shocked by this. Who could debate a pope? They had nobody who was willing to do it. Finally, uh, one of their own, Shlomo, which is, Shlomo is the word Solomon made more adaptable to daily use, uh, who usually gained boldness through his drink, uh, he, would, he volunteered to debate the pope. So on the appointed day, the pope on one side of St. Peter's and Shlomo, now sober, on the other side. So the pope begins with a motion. He takes both arms, hands up like this, and makes a huge circle with his palms up. And then he looks at Shlomo. Shlomo takes one hand and points emphatically to the floor. End of round one. The pope then held three fingers and then said with one finger. Shlomo looks at that, says one finger, and again points to the ground. End of round two. Pope finally brings out the holy sacraments, wine and bread, and sets them in front of him. Shlomo looks at him, furls his eyebrow, and then takes an apple out of his sleeve and bites the apple. End of round three, and the Pope says, the Jews won, they can stay. Everybody is shocked. Afterward, the, Jew, the Christian merchants go to the Pope and say, what happened? Why did you say they could stay? How did he possibly beat you? The Pope said, well, I said that the creator of the universe is with us right now. And Shlomo said, no, God is here right now. He said, then I said, the Father, Son, and Holy Spirit are one. And he comes back and says, God is only one. And he's right. In the third time, I took out the sacraments, and I said that Jesus Christ has taken away the sin of the world. He looked at me and took out an apple and bit it, meaning that sin is still with us, and he's right. The Jews can stay. Now, across town, back in a tavern that Shlomo liked, the Jewish merchants were saying, what on earth happened? And Shlomo said, well, the Pope said, all you Jews are going to have to leave town. And I said, no, we're staying right here. <laughs> and then he said, in three days, not one Jew will be left in town. And Shlomo says, we're not going anywhere. And then finally, and they said, what happened then? And he said, well, he took out his lunch, so I took out mine. <laughs> Gestures might be misinterpreted, but the word of God cannot be. In fact, in, in Romans it says, who is known the mind of the Lord? Nobody. In us, he makes it clear through the living word. It won't be confused. And that's what the disciples and what we learn today. And that's one of the reasons that John is really big with the word signs. You might, when you read it, have the word miracle in there, but they were signs. They were unexpectedly showing something that uh, was real. It pointed to a reality beyond itself. The wine being changed or transformed completely pointed to something else, not just wine. The Word became flesh, John says, and made a dwelling among us. We have seen His glory, the glory of the one and only, meaning God, who came from the Father, full of grace and truth. That's what this miracle is about, grace and truth. Changing water to wine in this part of chapter 2, and later in whipping the money changers in the temple, uh, that's truth. He was living out truth. You see what he is doing. This also says, this was the first, this is in the last part of today's text, this was the first sign. First means in a series. John was going to, after the fact, write a series of miracles or signs 
that were to show his deity and who he was. It also means primary. It becomes the one thing that pictures everything else that's about to happen. He transforms, and he has the power and the authority to do it. He comes to an old, decaying, dreams-shattered environment and gives hope that they might dream again for a new deal and a new future. So what was the point behind just this miracle? It says that the disciples might believe. And believe in their day meant not just cognitive thinking, it meant acting on what you now trust. And that's what they did. This becomes the essence of what Jesus is about, transforming broken dreams into living dreams. Now, the wedding was on the third day, and John, I think, deliberately uses that, points that out to us, because that's symbolic of the resurrection. Jesus was dead three days and was transformed back into life. In the Old Testament, the third day is usually used as the day that God is going to heal Israel. In Kings, it says, this is what the Lord, the God, says, I have heard your prayer and seen your tears, broken dreams, shattered. I will heal you. On the third day from now, you will go into the temple, which is God's presence. And in John, God's presence is now with us. In Hosea, after two days, he will revive us. On the third day, he will restore us, that we might live in his presence. And that's what Jesus did. The cross, the curtain was torn in two. Now we can go in freely. And on the day of resurrection, God says, I accept that redemption price, the death of my son, and now you have life. That is the first hint of the transition is this wedding. Now, in the Eastern way of doing things, weddings are a little different than they are here in the West. In the West, we honor the bride. She dresses up, she's stunning, she walks down the center aisle, everybody's looking at her, this is her day. The groom, he's just there. In the Eastern world, the groom is the center stage, not the bride. He pays for everything, he orchestrates everything, he does the betrothal, usually waits a year, comes back and then takes her to her new home, and it's all about the groom. And in those days at a wedding, which could last seven to ten days, they would do the wedding vows in the evening, and then the feast would start, and it could go, like I said, seven to two weeks, seven days to two weeks. They are then led back to the new home under a canopy. They take their time so people can greet them, and then the feast begins. It's all about the groom, because he provides everything. He's paying for it. Everything is his responsibility. Just as Jesus, our bridegroom, provides for us everything. The significance of a wedding as the first sign is that they know in Isaiah, for example, the, the wedding, being married to God, was the purpose of Israel. No longer will they be calling you deserted, for your land will be deserted, for the Lord will take delight in you, and you will be married to Him. As a young man arrives uh, marries a, a maiden, as a bridegroom rejoices over his bride, so will your God rejoice over you, his bride. Their anticipation was, and their, their thinking, well, we are the bride of Christ, or a bride of God. So what happened? Why are we slaves to Rome? In that day, declares the Lord, you will call me my husband, and I will betroth you forever. Later, for your Maker is your husband, and you are his wife. The book of John shows how Jesus reunites us with our bridegroom because we're the bride. In this particular text, Mary seems prominent, but we don't know why. She is concerned about the wine, lack of wine, and she also apparently has the power to tell the servants to, do, to listen to Jesus. So she's not just an everyday common you know, guest at this wedding, but we don't know what. But she does point out to Jesus the fact that their wine ran out. 
I kind of think. It wasn't a, hey, Jesus, the wine's out. Would you please do something right now? It's not that direct. It's kind of like an elbow in his rib saying, they ran out of wine. It was more informative, but hidden expectation that he's going to do something. Now, in the Eastern culture, hospitality is pretty big. And if you were to invite a guest over and not provide for him, it was shameful. You would now have made a faux pas, a red carpet faux pas, and your family would suffer the shame. This young couple found out that the wine was running short, and it's the groom's fault. So his family would have faced shame, disaster, social at, you know, talk of the town. Can you believe they ran out of wine? It was a nightmare when it should have been a blessing. And, but to them, the drama was very real. And here is Jesus taking what would appear to them to be major, but in reality isn't that big of a deal, and doing something about it. The rabbis used to say, without wine there is no joy. And the joy had just run out. Joy brings radiance. In Jeremiah it says, they were radiant over the goodness of the Lord. When you drink the wine of the field, you are celebrating the God of the harvest, which is why in the confession I had put down that what we, we neglect what he has done for us already in gratitude. No matter who you are, whether you drink wine or not, the wine of life will eventually run out. You are going to hit a brick wall with something in your life in which it will no more be Disneyland every day for the rest of your life. It will no longer be steak and lobster every day for the rest of your life. Those get tedious. The fun goes. The spectacular, the awe disappears. Now, I don't know how you are handling losing Craig, a pastor that's been here for 10 plus years. That could be a crisis. Well, it is a crisis because now you've got to discern in a new way a new leader, a new proclaimer of the gospel, a new shepherd who will care for you. Or you might be facing family illness or family disaster, broken relationships. You might be facing inner sense of shame and I could have done better and life has killed the dreams I dream. I don't know what individually or corporately you're facing, but the wine has run out sometime in your life. Where is yours? Do you have the feeling of being maybe like this groom's feeling in this wedding? That what are you going to do? Well, I don't want you to worry because Jesus is here, just like he was there. He uses these crises at times to open our eyes that we have established our lives on the values that are ultimately unreliable. Usually we are feeling secure in a church with, when everything's running smoothly. Usually when our bodies are doing really well, we, we have no bumps in life. When we have food on the table, we're not too worried about where it's going to come from. But you let something happen that can change all that. And you will know what it means to have this pain, this agony, and this fear of broken dreams. Now, Mary had probably been told by the five disciples that he brought with him, his new disciples, that he gathered up between John's prologue and by the time he reaches Cana, of his baptism, of John the Baptist saying, this is the Lamb of God who takes away the sin of the world. And at the baptism, a dove comes down, and uh, there's a voice that's heard, and Mary reawakens the dreams of what happened to her when, as a virgin, she got pregnant through the Holy Spirit. This will be the Messiah. You will name him Jesus, God is Yahweh is salvation. And uh, she had these dreams. Well, now at age 30-ish, now, if he's, since he's called his disciples, now is the time to act. They ran out of wine. She didn't know what he was going to do, but she counted on his character. God's people didn't know how God was going to act. But once again, I love this Isaiah, or this Psalm passage where it says, God's love is meteoric. This, by the way, is the, new, the message translation. His loyalty, astronomic. His purpose, titanic. His verdicts, oceanic. Yet in his largest, largeness, nothing gets lost. Not a man, not a mouse, slips through the cracks. 
Here's the God who created the entire universe, galaxies, and he knows the number of hairs on my head. That's the God that's at this wedding, and that's the God that's with you right now. Now, Jesus' response, woman, what have you got to do with me, is not a put down. He's not telling mom, butt out. To us, it looks like he's being disrespectful, calling his mother a woman. But I just want to remind you, at the cross, he also says, woman, behold your son, meaning John, and John, behold your mother. It was not a, a degrading term. But what it was was telling her her place now is no longer as a mother who's going to guide him. It'll be his heavenly father who he's going to listen to. She might see a problem and tell him to get acting, but he only will listen from now on to the father. I must be about my father's business. I and the father are one. I, the son can do nothing without the father. And then as he's praying in the Gethsemane, Lord, this is our God, Father, I, I, I want this cup to pass, but not my will, your will. Mom, I know you have good intentions, but you're not my director. My father is. So the glory of this is he chooses his father's will. And glory just means I'm giving honor to or praise or weight to. So when we glorify God, we're giving weight to the fact that he's God and we're not. And I love the fact that when we have problems, sometimes it good, it's good to walk out and look at the creation, which is why I used Psalm 8 in part of the call of worship. When you realize the vastness of God, who are we that you even think about us? Because usually our problems are right in front of our face, and we don't know how it's going to handle. And then we step outside and see the stars that he created, and we'll never reach the end of them, and it's still going on. Who am I that you even care about me? Well, he's the God who does care. And then he tells his mom, my hour has not yet come. His hour, if you know the rest of Scripture, was going to be his entrance into Jerusalem, his betrayal, his trial, and his death and, and then resurrection. That was his hour in which, paradoxically, his glory would be most seen in the crucifixion. That's why later John, again, in his first letter says, the blood of Jesus, his son, purifies us from all sin. Now, chapter 1 starts off with, here is the lamb who takes away the sins of the world. You haven't read it yet, but chapter 2 ends with, destroy this temple, and I will raise it again in three days. So it goes from the blood of the lamb to end of chapter 2, I will be raised again. Something brand new is happening grace and truth. So he knew his purpose. Mary expected him to do something, and I'm curious how often we really expect him to do something. We often muddle around in little circles, dwelling on all of our problems, and don't expect him to do a thing. We don't really believe he's interested in our ordinary problems. Do you? She trusted him for his time, God's time. Do we? Or do we fret because he didn't answer us yesterday? Sometimes it takes years of prayer before an answer happens. Do we decide maybe he's hard of hearing and has given up? Do you trust him? In spiritual discernment, are we willing to say, teach me what you're doing here in me or through me? Trusting his timing his purpose, and his methodology. And that's what she meant when she said, whatever he says, do it. Show that you trust him. At one point in his life, Jesus is asked, what, please tell us what we should be doing that we might be doing the work of God. And he simply says, this is the work of God that you trust in him and the one he sent. Trust seems to be the crux here. Now, in a Jewish home, there are usually jars of water to clean your hands with, and some often your feet too. And for the Jew, eating a dinner with unclean hands you made you unclean. And not only did they wash their hands prior, but they washed it at the beginning of every course that was offered in the meal, especially a feast. A lot of water. There were six of these jars, each one holding uh, 
I wrote down it, the total amount of gallons for the six would have been 120 to 180 gallons. It's a lot of wine. It's going to last them far beyond this party. But the water of purification takes the Jew back to the water used in the temple and to, to purify and set apart things and cleanse it. Like they would set aside any utensil used in temple worship with water to cleanse it. And then the priests would wash in water, then they'd have their blood anointed to their forehead, their thumbs, and their toe, that God might consecrate their mind, what they think, what they do with their hands, and where they go. They were set aside and purified, and that's how the Jews viewed that water. Jesus takes the water of purification and turns it into something brand new, life-giving wine. Inorganic to organic. Dead, everyday water to something that's alive. And that's what he does to us. He takes us dead in our dreams, wandering around with ourselves, our own gods, whether we want to admit that or not, and he transforms us into beginning a journey of trusting him. Now, in the Lord's Supper, they remember this with four cups of wine. The first cup, and each, each by the way, each cup in a Jewish Passover Seder comes out of the four different verbs that Moses writes for us in Exodus 6 that God said, I will bring you out, first cup, the cup of sanctification. I will deliver you, and that's praise because they usually sing Psalms 113, 114, which starts with praise. The third cup, which is what Jesus took when he said, this is my blood, is called the cup of redemption or the cup of blessing. And that's the one he says, this is my blood poured out for you. And then the final cup is, uh, I will take you to be my people, which is called the cup of acceptance or Elijah. God picked Elijah to come. There's only one way to be clean, by drinking the cup, symbolic of the fact that you have been washed by that blood. And that was what it was about. These, these servants could choose to either ignore him or do it. They did it. Didn't know why. They didn't argue with him. Why? What has having water filled in a jug got to do with lack of wine? They didn't argue. They just did it. We oftentimes don't know what he does to us through things. Why did he call Craig away now? Why did he cause this illness now? Why did he call my bank to something to happen in my bank, which has happened? Uh, why? Well, he doesn't want us to look so much at why, but who is going to be in charge of how it's solved? Him. And that's where faith comes in. He takes us from faith to faith. In Chronicles Narnia, uh, there's a scene which one of the characters, Lucy, uh, finally sees Aslan, um, the lion, who is the Jesus figure. And uh, he has appeared to them several times, and they've ignored it. So now she at night is drawn to him. And she says, Aslan, Aslan, dear Aslan, saw Lucy at last. Welcome, child, he said. Aslan said, Lucy, you're bigger. That is because you are older, little one, answered he. Not because you are? I am not. But every year you grow, you will find me bigger. And that's what the disciples, and that's what we are going to find. Every year we grow in faith, he's going to get bigger than we possibly could imagine. They didn't know who he really was in John 1. They caught the glimmer at this one. But three years later, after the resurrection, they knew who he was. And supposedly, all of the surviving 11 disciples were killed for being his disciple. He is the Lord of life who transforms things, and the, and the disciples believed in him. Do you? Do you believe that he's able to take something that isn't living and bring back life? He can take broken dreams and restore them to his dream. He can take weakness and turn it to strength. Why? Because he's God. God in three, Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. So I'd like to invite you now to take the Nicene Creed that I've given to you there. And let's read it out loud together. You all have it? Okay. We believe in one God, the Father, the Almighty, maker of heaven and earth, 
of all that is seen and unseen. We believe in one Lord Jesus Christ, the only Son of God, eternally begotten of the Father, God from God, light from light, true God from true God, begotten, not made, of one being with the Father. Through Him all things were made. From us and our salvation, He came down from heaven, was incarnate of the Holy Spirit and the Virgin Mary, and became truly human. For our sake, He was crucified under Pontius Pilate. He suffered death and was buried. On the third day, He rose again in accordance to the Scriptures. He ascended into heaven and is seated at the right hand of the Father. He will come again with glory to judge the living and the dead, and His kingdom will have no end. We believe in the Holy Spirit, the Lord and giver of life, who proceeds from the Father and the Son, who with the Father and the Son is worshiped and glorified, who has spoken through the prophets. We believe on one holy Catholic and apostolic church, we acknowledge one baptism for the forgiveness of sins. We look for the resurrection of the dead and the life of the world to come. Amen. Life in the world to come. A dream is restored and our hope is back. Do you believe it? Do you act on that belief? Truly? People are searching for purpose in life. They're searching for God. They're searching if Jesus is really that way. So how well do you know Jesus? I'd like to encourage, if you don't, that you accept Him simply as a Savior and Lord, that you set aside yourself with a right to run your own life and say that He died for your sin and you're accepting Him as Lord. Either He's Lord of all or He's not Lord at all. And then watch what He can do as He restores dreams. So here in this parable, here is Jesus. He takes water and brings forth wine. He takes what's everyday common and he turns it into something truly miraculous. He takes what's empty and he brings forth in great abundance. He takes what's old and he brings forth newness. He takes disappointment and gives you instead joy. He takes what is shame and gives you grace. He takes what is absolutely impossible and He gives you hope. He takes what is chaos and gives you peace. He is Jesus, our Jesus, our King Jesus, our Savior Jesus, Jesus our God. No one is greater. Do you know Him? Let us pray. Triune God, Father, Son, and Holy Spirit, thank you for all that you have done to transform us, to take away our sin, and allow us to become all that we were meant to be when you first thought of us. We thank you now that as we face whatever disappointments or challenges in front of us, that confident and believing and trusting in you, they might become opportunities to see you at work. And we thank you now in the name of Jesus, the Lamb of God, who took away each of our sins. Amen. Good morning. Um, I'm going to give a moment for mission. Uh, Guatemalan mission team report, uh, First United Presbyterian Church of Turlock, team with compassionate leadership from the Bethel Ministries International. Our team, Christian McPherson, Nick Wright, Victoria Brown, and myself, plus eight other extraordinary team members from Modesto, Fresno, and New Jersey.
This is our entire mission team on the community stage of one of the many small municipalities within Guatemala City's 11 million inhabitants. We had just completed our first day activities distributing of wheelchairs. Okay. I'm turning too fast here. Mission objectives to make daily first contact home visits providing food, clothes, and demonstrating the love of Christ, to provide and custom fit 46 wheelchairs and provide life-changing mobility, build three homes with concrete floors, vented stove, beds, bathroom, and a solar panel for lights and phone charging, provide a vac vacation Bible school for the children of the mission area to demonstrate the love of Christ. Results. Home visits. Our team made 11 home visits during the week. Each family received a month's supply of fortified rice and multivitamins, multivitamins. Each adult and each child received three items of clothes and a pair of shoes. Children received the toy when appropriate. Soccer balls were really big. Ben and Emily took time learning about the family situation. Family income, health, food security, children's educational level. Often Bible verses were shared to provide guidance and hope for the family's concerns. 75 adults and children received hope and assurance of Christ's love during the week. Uh, results, wheelchairs. Wheelchair distribution was a privilege for our entire team. Bethel Ministries restores and distributes these year round. The shop in Guatemala that performs these wheelchair restorations has 12 employees and 10 of them are wheelchair bound. The young boy in the center was not able to attend school unless he had a, a self-propelled wheelchair. He can now. The lady on the right wanted a special lowered wheelchair without foot support so she could maneuver around her small workspace with her feet only. Nick and Victoria delivered. 46 people were provided life-changing mobility on this first day of Christ, our first day of Christ's mission in Guatemala. Results, houses. House construction was the most physically demanding task of the Lord's mission. There were up to 20 different people contributing to the build, led by Bethel Ministries, uh, Ben, Emily, Nick, and Elizabeth, plus local municipal employees who volunteered their time. The crew was rotated in and out regularly for water breaks to prevent the heat stress from, uh, to prevent heat stress related problems. I'm running along with my moment, so if there's any requests, uh, any, anything you are interested, you can ask me in the void all afterwards. Completed homes. Uh, these families were blessed by your generosity. Uh, the, the amounts below were, are, were uh, monies received after we went on the mission and it allowed for uh, extra beds to be purchased and actually the the, the family in the middle was able to get a deed for their house for $257 so we could build it. So I really thank you all from the Stephanie's uh, sermon two weeks ago. That money came through. It really was appreciated. VBS was a great success. Uh, notice the image on the right. We were setting up tables behind early arriving vacation Bible, uh, Bible school children. Very shortly after this photo, was taken, it became very apparent we needed more room and we had to move outside for the craft and refreshment tables as the, ch as the church soon filled with 132 children. Praise the Lord. Mission summary. During the mission seven days in Guatemala, 277 people felt the love of Christ. Stephanie preached two weeks ago, go do something. Every, per every person that purchased a Guatemala fundraising dinner ticket, uh, underwrote a dinner, cooked a dinner, washed dishes, gave direct donation, or even went to Guatemala, did something. Thank you all for your mission, for your mission team and Bethel. Thank you all from your mission team and Bethel Ministries. And one, one special personal point, I want to thank my wife for encouraging uh, myself and my granddaughter to go on this tour. Thank you.
That was a wonderful report. Thank you, Rich. Um, the night that Rich was about the end of the the end of the uh, mission trip, Rich called me with a, a short report. A short report from this person who does not like to speak in front of people. I was about to leave the house to go out to dinner and I couldn't get out the door because he kept going on. He was so excited. <laughs> and so if you engage him in some conversation after worship, you will experience some of that overwhelming excitement for what they were able to do in Guatemala. So what we do here is just as exciting. We are part of the mission and ministry of Jesus Christ. Every day there are things happening that we participate in. So if you have offerings to give, there's a box in the back of the sanctuary, you know the drill. There's also a slot outside the um, office door. You can give online and you can give through the U.S. mail. So please be generous. Give however you can. Let us pray. Gracious and loving God, we ask that you would bless the gifts that are given today as well as those given each day, so that the people you love around the world may know just how much you love them. We pray this in Jesus' name. Amen.
now. How's that? Better? Yes. Okay. Well, for those of you who did not hear, Neil's passing happened a few weeks ago, and his memorial service was last Wednesday in Hollister, and we were not able to give you that information in a timely manner, and I'm sorry for that. As we come to, um, to the Lord in prayer, I will repeat your uh, prayer requests, and then I would like all of us to respond, O oh Lord, hear our prayers, prayers that you bring to today. I did. Pat Lumicana's eye surgery is Tuesday. Pat's eye surgery is Tuesday. Oh Lord, hear our prayers. prayers. Yes, for for the camp Calvin Crest for uh, the campers and the counselors, uh, that they have a wonderful, safe time and get to know the Lord a little better. Oh Lord, hear our prayers. Yes. For Ron and Judy struggling with health issues. Oh Lord, hear our prayers. Lord, you have heard some of the concerns of our hearts and some of our joys. You know us better than we know ourselves. And we give you thanks and praise for that. Every step that we take is taken with you. You have not left our sides, no matter the circumstance. So those prayers that are so deeply seated within us are known to you. You hold us. You hold us. whether we want it or not. But you bring us comfort. If only we would reach out and take your hand. Lord, be with us. And hear us now as with one voice we say the prayer that you taught, saying, O oh, our Father, who art in heaven, Hallowed be thy name, thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our debts as we forgive our debtors. Lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom, and the power, and the glory forever. Amen. If you are able and would like to stand as we sing our closing hymn, To God Be the Glory.
the benediction that you have in here is meant to be a meditation about culminating everything that was said. I'd like to offer you the famous benediction to Aaron and then add it to a New Testament applying of it. The Lord bless you and keep you above and beyond what you could ask or think. The Lord make his face shine upon you, revealing the depths of his infinite love. The Lord be gracious to you, filling your heart with new mercies. The Lord lift up his countenance upon you, reminding you that you are chosen and valued. And the Lord give you peace, assuring you of his covenant faithful care. And all God's people said,